systems with many degrees of freedom. There is a coarse grain description, which we'll call as fluctuating hydrodynamics. So for a diffusive system, if I'm looking at a system of many particles, and I want to look at the evolution of the coarse-grained density profile, then this fluctuating hydrodynamics is written in terms of this stochastic differential equation. So rho of xt is my coarse-grained density profile. Okay. So, it, so I was choosing, sorry, I was choosing q as my density notation. And I'm already in the coarse grain scale where x is the real space divided by some length scale. And I use a diffusive scaling of the time. Okay. And there I had used this scaling of the density, so rho of x t goes to q of small x t. And the macroscopic, sorry, the microscopic current in the original uh, coordinate space goes to one over L, the coarse grain current. And then the evolution of this coarse grain density and current profile is governed by this fluctuating hydrodynamic equation, which is given by one part is as a continuity equation. And the other part is where we write the current with a part which follows Hick's law. Plus, there is a fluctuating part which is modeled by a stochastic noise whose mean is zero and covariance is given by sigma q of xt delta t minus t prime delta x minus y. So these are all in one dimension, but it could easily generalize these things for higher dimensional systems. Okay, so then starting with this, I presented that one could think of the time evolution in a path integral form. So you now think about um, it's the schematic in a high dimensional configuration space or where I'm looking at the evolution. So if I look at the evolution of these two coupled coarse grain fields, they are governed by an action. So if I'm interested in this following problem, that I start at time t equal to zero, I demand that at time capital T, I want to see this density profile, to be, let's say at R of x. I start q at x zero as being the rho of x. Then this probability, be written in a path integral, which could have a Lagrangian picture or a Hamiltonian picture, but I just write the Hamiltonian form, so which had okay. this was the action, the L plays the large parameter for us, where the action has this form. This is all I'm repeating from yesterday. I'm going to use these things again today. Where H is given by sigma Q divided by two. So this is almost like a kinetic part. And this you may think of as a the potential part.
So this is where we were yesterday. And then I solved this one particular problem where we had this thing in mind that we are looking at a one dimensional system of partic interacting particles. They couple the heat path, sorry, couple the particle path at the two ends with two different densities. Then I wanted to find out what is the probability distribution for seeing a particular density fluctuations, R of x. Okay. And the way the problem was formulated then, just similar to as in the case of Langevin equation, the problem was that I start at minus t equal to minus infinity at a profile, so t at minus infinity, so I want qx at minus infinity. This is at the most probable profile. I want at qx at zero to be at rx. And then all I have to do is to find out the contribution which comes from the least action path because that's the one which is the dominating path. Okay. So all I had to then calculate is given these conditions, find out what are the minimal actions paths and then put it in the action and that would give me my large deviation function which was written in this form. So q of, so the density r of x, the final time, this had this large deviation form L this is now the phi is a functional and phi r of x is the s min of t and q. Okay. Then what I did is for the case of equilibrium, so when the situation is in equilibrium, that means I take rho a equal to rho b equal to zero. So the most likely profile rho of x is simply rho. For this case, the large deviation function I calculated using this time reversibility idea. Okay? So that's what I did yesterday. So today what I will do, I will again solve this problem, but in a little different way. The reason I would solve it this way because See, when the system is outside equilibrium, that is in the case when rho a not equal to rho b, this uh, property of time reversibility will not work. So how does one solve the problem when the system is outside equilibrium? Okay. So for that, I will solve first the equilibrium problem in a little different way. And then I will show you that using that kind of idea, one could solve some models outside equilibrium. Okay. So let me first uh, present solving this equilibrium problem where I'm asking what's the probability distribution of seeing a density fluctuation. Okay. So the idea is to use this thing which we already know or we have learned in classical mechanics. It's called canonical transformation. So you know in classical mechanics sometimes when we do this, uh, try to find the minimal action paths, it's sometimes difficult to solve, solve the least action paths. And then what one does, it, one makes a transformation of this P and Q variables to another set of variables, such that the new set of variables satisfy against a Hamilton's equation with respect to a new Hamiltonian. So this kind of transformations are known as canonical transformation. And the reason is that, that now in the problem in terms of the new variables becomes simple. So that was the idea. So here I will show you that there is a transformation for this equilibrium problem that when I just write in terms of a new variable, the problem becomes quite trivial. And, I, and you know that in one case, the problem becomes trivial when the system goes downhill. So if I start at the excited state, which is the atypical profile, and then I ask it to go to the most likely profile, there the problem is very simple. Okay. So the idea is that I start with this problem, okay, where I start at a, so in this problem I start at minus infinity at a typical profile, then I ask what's the probability to see an atypical profile at a future time. Okay. That problem using a canonical transformation, I'll transform into a reverse problem where the solution is very simple to see. Okay. So let me just write down what transformation one needs to do. So before I make the transformation, 
Let's just rewrite this Hamiltonian in a slightly different format. This I'm going to rewrite. What I'll do, I'll just take del xp common okay, and I'll just write it as I just took this del xp common and okay. so just rewrote the Hamiltonian in a different way. Now the transformation. So let's make a transformation where Q of xt becomes the Q hat of x minus t p of xt becomes minus t hat of x minus t plus rho q hat x minus t ds twice ds by sigma s. Okay. So this is a transformation I want to make. So of course, it was not very easy all the time to find out what transformation would uh, one would get. So it was just after a trial or error, one would find this kind of transformation. Okay, so all what I did, I'm now going to write the whole problem in terms of this q hat variable and p hat variable. Okay, it's clear so far? Okay, so now let's just look at how the problem now looks. Okay. So now let's look at the form of the action here. So my original problem now in terms of P and Q in this form, and the action has this term. So first let's look at how does this term transforms in terms of these new variables. Okay, so let's just see that. So now you see my original problem that I start at minus infinity time T, T, I have dx, and P, Q dot. Okay, what I do is just use now replace p by this formula, okay? Then first write this part, okay? So I have dt, dx, then I have q dot, and the first term is rho q hat x minus t, ds. So I'm going to do this algebra a little slow so that you understand what's going on. For the case of non-equilibrium, I will not do any of the algebras. So this was came from this, this part. The other part is simply, again, dt minus infinity to zero, dx, d hat, x minus t. Then I had, okay, so I had then q dot, Okay, so now I rewrite the q dot in terms of q hat variables, which would simply I would write as d d t of q hat x minus t. Even here I do the same. Okay. Now I just redefine t to minus t. What would become then first part would become dt. So after this change of sign of time, it would now become from zero to infinity dx. Then I have now ddt of q hat x t. And then I have this term, same thing. Only here, now it's Q of X T. No minus here. Okay. Here there was minus, there's no minus. Here. The second term then simply becomes DT from zero to infinity, DX, T hat, X T, DDT of Q hat, X T. This term I will write again later on, but let's look at what happened to the Hamiltonian. Okay. So if you look at the form of the Hamiltonian the way I wrote here, okay, and I just replace the form of P here. 
you'd see that immediately, in terms of p hat variable, it has exactly the same form. Because when you put the p hat here, this term would cancel, so it will give you del x p hat. On the other hand, when you write this one, okay, you'll just get back this term. There's a minus sign which would cancel each other. Okay? So the idea is that, so now, the form of Hamiltonian, which was in terms of PQ, is exactly the same as in terms of P hat, Q hat. Okay. So now, if I take the form of the action now, okay. so I had PQ dot and Hamiltonian, I write the whole action in terms now of this P hat, Q hat variable. So my old action, which was P, now become, I'll write down first this part. Okay. So let me just write from here. So now S P Q. This became, this came from the first part. The second part is now this minus the same H in terms of P hat Q hat. Is clear so far? So I just rewrote the action in this different form. Now you would realize now here that this term only depends on the value of q hat at the final time and at the initial time, okay? which are fixed. Because if I use this transformation and I use the boundary condition before I had that x at minus infinity, this was rho. So this means q hat at x plus infinity, this is rho. The other condition was x zero was r of x. Now in terms of hat variables, this becomes x zero as r of x. Okay. So this term is constant. I'm not changing anything over the field. Okay. So this term I can take out. So when I'm looking at now the probability here, I'm now writing one part, so I have to move, I'm going to write this part as my new action. And the term before, I'd pull out in front. So there was, the first part was came here. Now the problem in terms of new variables Become simply this. Okay? But now if you think about, I have transformed the problem, which was an uphill problem, to a downhill problem. Because now I start at a at Rx at time t equal to zero, which is an atypical profile. Then I want to relax to a typical profile, which is the constant row. Okay? So then it's it's very simple to see that. Contribution for a downhill trajectory, the contribution, the minimal action is simply zero because it does not cost anything uh, at the exponentially small level. Is this point clear that when I'm going uh, on a downhill slope okay, from an atypical to a typical profile, the, it's, uh, the path is not exponentially small uh, in, or with a small weight. Okay. So the, if it, the minimal contribution that one finds or that downhill solution is simply zero. Okay. This you can also verify by simply writing down the least action path equation, and you will see that the solution would come from the, for the optimal path, the p hat is zero, okay. and q hat is simply following the equation, which is the noiseless solution. Okay. So the contribution, so the, in this entire path, the problem now reduced, where this contribution from this part of this action is simply zero now. Okay, so my phi would simply come from this part. Is it clear so far? Okay. Okay, so now let's just check if this is true. So my phi of Rx would simply be this part. Okay. Let's just verify that if it gives us the known result in equilibrium very simple. I'm just going to, so let's just rewrite what was here. Twice ds by sigma s. Okay. What I'm going to do is I know that this term 
is f double prime of s. Okay, that I proved uh, yesterday. If I write it in this way, then it simply becomes dt zero to infinity dx, then q hat dot. If I do this integration, this is simply f prime of q hat minus f prime of rho. Just do this integration, it's very simple. I did this again uh, yesterday, and it will give us our result that we have obtained before. Simply f, so d of, so this is integral dx from zero to one, f of rx minus f of rho minus f prime of rho, rx minus rho. Okay. So all I did in this problem, which is the repetition of this the problem which I solved yesterday, the equilibrium version, that I made a change of variable, which is a canonical transform, by which I made the problem, which was an uphill problem, to a downhill problem, where the solution was trivial. So this would be the idea to use for the outside equilibrium system. So you see, in this web solving, I never used this time reversibility concept. Okay. So for a problem in outside equilibrium, all one has to do is to find this change of variable or the canonical transformation, which will make an uphill problem to a downhill problem. But this is a very non-trivial task. Okay. And this is where all the ingenuity comes for the people who try to solve these problems. So what I am going to leave as an exercise, the case of non-interacting particle case, where a very similar transformation like this will give you the result even outside equilibrium. For the case of symmetric exclusion process, I will not tell you what is the transformation because it's a very, it's a non-local, uh, quite non-intuitive transformation, but I'll give you the reference where you can find out the transformation. Okay. So now let me give, leave it as an exercise. This I need. So I wanted that. Now, so this is a problem for non-interacting. In terms of the fluctuating hydrodynamics, this only corresponds to D of Q being one and sigma of q being twice q. This also I proved yesterday okay, for non-interacting. Then what I want you to show that in the case where rho a is not equal to rho b, first the average profile, which is the most likely profile in the stationary state, is given by rho of x, simply rho a, one minus x, plus rho b, x. Then, using the same action minimization principle, and finding a transformation which is very similar to this one, almost exactly the same one for the non-interacting case, you have to show that the large deviation form, of course, be the same again, Remember, this is now outside equilibrium. Okay. And phi of r of x has this very simple form, which uh, Sriram wrote yesterday. So now I'm going to make comments about the symmetric exclusion process. So symmetric exclusion process is one model which plays a very important role in the exact solutions of for non-equilibrium systems. It has been solved by matrix product Anzat and also by Bethe Anzat. 
techniques. So there's lots of integrability techniques. But one could also solve the problem using this kind of uh, action formulation. So what was the symmetric exclusion process? Let me just remind you. It's the problem which is on a lattice. And coupling with, again, two different res particle reservoirs. And every site would be occupied by at most one particle at a time. And the particles, they have this following dynamics, that it jumps to either of the neighboring sites with jump rate one, okay, as long as the destination site is empty. Okay. Okay. So here, solving this problem and finding the corresponding large deviation function in the stationary state is a very non-trivial task. Okay? And this was solved by many different methods, but there's one way of solving, which is by this canonical transformation of the action formulations. And let me give you the reference there. You can look at what transformation one took. Okay? So this is by one is Bertini et al. And this is in PRL 87, 2001. Okay. And the second one is by Julia Tayu et al. Again in PRL, so it's in a little different way, that both uses this action formulation. Okay. So you may wonder if why does one try to even solve these kind of interacting particle systems? So I think you should keep in mind that, think about why people even solve the, let's say, 2D Ising model problem. It was the kind of models where one could solve results exactly and get the information exactly. And then from those exact results, one tries to infer about more general properties of systems. Okay. So you, how many of you have solved 2D Ising model in your uh, classes? Okay, that's a pretty good number. Maybe I should tell this story. So, you know, I did my PhD with uh, Professor Deepak Dhar, and sometimes I would just go and ask for a recommendation letter from him if I want to go to some school or something. And he would play this game. He would Tell me, okay, I'll ask you a question right now, and if you could solve that question, depending on what answer you would give, uh, I'll write a recommendation letter like that. And one of his favorite questions was to solve the 2D Ising model on board. So by the end of my PhD, I knew that this is his favorite question, so it, I practiced a lot of this 2D Ising model, and hopefully I got a good recommendation letter. But if people who haven't really seen the solution of 2D Ising model, I think one sh it's very instructive that one should actually go through the solution once. So there's this one paper which, which solution I actually like. I mean, I think it's one of the simple solutions. is by Elliot Leap. And Mattis. Uh, I just, just look for, uh, so I don't remember the title. It's, I think, um, 2D Ising models. <laughs> Solutions of 2D Ising models and many fermions, or something like that. Okay. okay, so something similar is happening here. Okay, so if you people who know the solution, you know that uh, there one need to take a very non-local transformation, which is called Jordan Wigner transformation, which made the solution quite easy. Okay, similar idea goes in the solution of the symmetric exclusion process, but now we are in this action formulation where one has to do a very non-local canonical transformation, which leads to, the, to a very simple problem, and that's how one could solve this symmetric exclusion process. And this is done in these two papers. So I'm not going to give this solution this way. I'll give another approach, which is known as Hamilton-Jacobi method, where we can really very easily check what is the solution. Okay? So let me just write down what was the solution. So I'm going to write down what was the form of the large deviation function. And this is one of those non-trivial results which tell us a lot about non-equilibrium systems to some extent in general. So 
This is the solution of the large deviation function. in symmetric exclusion process outside equilibrium. I mean, the result also you would get it inside. It includes the result for equilibrium as well. So the result is the following. You should keep in mind that in the fluctuating hydrodynamic description, the SEP is defined by D of Q being 1, sigma of Q is twice Q, 1 minus Q. The only difference was this 1 minus Q from the non-interacting case. And that already makes the problem very difficult. Okay. So for this, let's just write down the solution first. So first, let me write down the case which was in equilibrium. So where the first Let's write down the case where rho a is equal to rho b. And I'm writing this because at least once you should see how the large deviation function looks for a system outside equilibrium. Okay. So first, let me write the equilibrium case. Okay. And you will see that there will be a very small difference, but which leads to quite different results. This was for the equilibrium. Now for the case of non-equilibrium, the difference that comes is just in this following part. So rho gets replaced by a function f of x. Here also it gets replaced by a function f of x. And in addition, there's a term which appears is del x of f of x divided by rho b minus rho a, okay, where f of x is given by, so this is something called a parametric form of the result, so f of x is determined in terms of rx from the solution of this quantity. One would usually find that outside equilibrium, the results for the large deviation or even cumulant generating function, they're not typically in an explicit form. They would often be written in terms of this kind of parametric form, where the function would be written in terms of another function, and that function is related to the Rx by another equation. The one thing that one could quite e rather simply see that this makes this large deviation function highly non-local. Okay. So how does one see? So one way to see this is just you make an expansion around rho a in a parameter rho a minus rho b. Okay. So what would that do? So it's just to see how the non-local nature comes. And then I will go into more details about how one could derive these kind of things. So if you write down an expansion, So, if I write down an expansion in terms of a parameter which is rho a minus rho b, so this result simply becomes this one part which is like the phi equilibrium. The phi equilibrium was like here, given by rho. Okay. But now this part, so if that first part I heard it, if I had written as rx comma rho, this is this part of the row. But now in general, you would be writing it as like this. Okay. Plus rho a minus rho b whole square. Okay. And then there is two integrals. And then there is some another function which is of x, y, so r of x, 
R of Y. And then go so on. But, so G of X, if you want to find, I'm not going to write down, the, okay, let me write down the expression for G. It's not so long. So G is X one minus Y, R of X minus rho of X, R of Y, minus rho of y. So first thing you just note that there is two integrals here, which means that the function is non-local. And as a consequence, if you remember what I told you in the first lecture, that if the large deviation function is non-local, which is like there are multiple spatial integrals, then your co spatial correlations would be long range. And that's what exactly what one would find for this problem. So from now onwards, what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you another method by which one could actually check that this is the solution, okay, which is known as the hamilton jacobi method of minimizing the action. And using that, I will present one approach where you could see that this long-range nature of the correlations appears quite generally for an arbitrary uh, outside equilibrium diffusive systems. Okay. So let me just now talk about this um, hamilton jacobi method. So, so far, is everything clear? Okay. I, mean, I had at some point planned about giving you how to solve this result for SEP, uh, but we don't have much time. But it is a really amazing solution. So someday you should really, if you are interested, really look at how this problem for SEP is solved. Okay, so let me now write down this another approach, which is, again, the minimization of the action. So if you remember in classical mechanics, there is something called hamilton jacobi method, which I also mentioned in the case of Langevin equation, which tells that if I have this action minimization problem, then one could make a canonical transformation by which one could actually write down directly an equation satisfied by that minimal action. Okay? So that's what is the hamilton jacobi equation. I wrote one form, which is this del phi del t to minus h in the Langevin equation. It's the same thing, but now in terms of fields. So let me just now rewrite. So in this macroscopy fluctuation theory, people actually try all these many different ways. Sometimes the Lagrange method, sometimes Hamilton's method, sometimes Hamilton Jacobi, because some problems could be solved in a certain way and um, in an easier method than the other ones. Okay. So this is known as the Hamilton Jacobi. just says this following, that if I had this action minimization, okay, so I told you that the minimal action is my large deviation function. Okay. So the large deviation function, for now, I'm looking at the same problem, that I start at less, so I start at the initial density profile, rho x, I want a profile r of x, and I want this large deviation function, phi, but now, I'm considering this following case, where I start at x equal to zero, so I start at t equal to zero at rho x, and I want to see my density at time t equal to capital T at, value, at profile r of x. So now in general, this function would depend on time. The hamilton jacobi equation is nothing but, so first you remember that within this action formulation, this is simply the S min of T with that minimal path. Okay. So let's write down the minimal path. P classical. So classical is nothing. I'm just drawing analogy with quantum mechanics. Okay. So these are the least action paths. But the R and rho dependence comes because they are solved with that boundary condition. So these paths are a function of R of rho x. So essentially, the hamilton jacobi equation is this following. So del of t, r of x. So from now onwards, I will not write the rho x, but it would be considered as implicitly there. Okay? So it's just for simplicity. This is minus h. So h is a function of p and q. And you only have to do is replace p by del phi 
del r and q by r. Okay, so this is the standard thing in classical mechanics. So you can either look at uh, how in classical mechanics this is derived, but I'll give you a, another very simple derivation of this formula for this action minimization problem. So there are many ways of arriving at that result, but I'll give you a very simple way to directly arrive at that equation. So let's just so keep in mind, so what I'm planning to do is at the end, I'm going to write down an equation for this large diffusion function. And the purpose is that I want to, at the end, if one solves this equation for the phi, then one would get the large deviation function. Okay, so this is an equation where I'm directly writing an equation for the minimal action. So how does one get to this? It's quite, actually quite standard. So remember now what I'm doing. I want to be at the profile R of X at a final time. Okay, so let's keep this picture in mind. So this is a schematic. I want to be at a profile R of X at time T. Okay. So I, all I need to think about is a tiny, what happens at the tiny time step before this T minus DT. And many things could happen. So let's say it is at profile Q of X. Okay, at time step, this DT time step before. And then there are many paths. So how would one write this? So this would simply be integral over all such profiles at time t minus dt. Probability of that and the probability to go from qx to rx, which let's just write as w of dt r of x, q of x, okay? Now this, I could very easily infer from this formula of the action. How does one do that? So let's just think about what would happen if I give you the qx, there are actually many trajectories which go and end up at rx. And where does that come from? It comes from this noise, which means that there are different currents which are move, happening. And they would lead to all these fluctuations. So let's just write down in terms of current flow. So I know now that I had this continuity equation minus del xj, which if I write discretize in terms of small time dt, this is nothing but you write as r of x minus q of x is equal to minus dt del x of j. Then this would mean that this conditional probability is simply that I look at all possible currents, which leads to different this tiny trajectories here. Okay. Then I have the probability for seeing that current, okay, which comes simply from this uh, form of the action. So let me just write, you already know this one, so L dt dx and j plus d of r del x of r whole square divided by twice sigma of r. So you remember this part came at the very beginning from the fluctuating hydrodynamics and all I'm writing in the leading order term in dt. So dt is very tiny small. So all the dependence here I'm replacing by the final point r of x. Just simple uh, differential cap. Hmm. No, 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 it's not a dot. This, yeah. Okay. Now, in addition, I'll of course have this, this condition I have to satisfy. Because J, uh, so R and Q are related by this J. So that would be R minus Q plus DT del X of J. Now it's very simple actually. What all you have to do, take this, Put it here, okay. 
and then the integral over q will be taken care by this delta function. Okay. So let me just write down. So now, pt simply d of j e to the power the same quantity here. This part. And then it should be simply p minus dt at r plus dt del x of j. Okay. The q integration is taken care of this delta function. Okay. So now it's quite standard thing. See, at the end, I'm expecting that this probability should have a for large division form like this. I am expecting this to be L phi of t r of x. So right now, j could be anything. If j could be very large, we should consider like this kind of profiles, which would be very unlikely. Okay. Only dt is small, so I'm just doing this differential calculus. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. These, so now everything is in small variables. So I'm already in the coarse grain variables. Everything is coarse grain variables. So this part has this large deficient form. This part, well, of course, the p of t would be e to the power minus l phi of t minus dt r plus dt del x of j. So this is the form I'm expecting. All now you have to do use this form, make everything expand up to linear order in dt. Okay. So this, you do a Taylor expansion, do up to linear order in dt. This is already in linear order in dt. So once you do that expansion of this formula up to linear order in dt, then you would realize that the j, the integral here, is simply Gaussian integration. Okay. You have to do an integration by parts, which is just simple algebra, and once you realize that it's a Gaussian integration, you can simply do that, and you will end up in a formula. Now, it would be a formula in terms of these phi functions. Okay. So from the exponential, I just go to the phi function. It's just a simple algebra. I'm just giving you the idea how it is done. So the expression that you'd get now is that so you will have something like phi t, minus phi of t minus dt, and there will be right hand side, there will be something of the order of dt. You would take it down and take dt small limit. It will give you the time derivative over phi. So at the end, you would arrive at the result minus sigma r to the two del x del phi del r square okay. but if you look at now this one this is exactly the form of the hamiltonian which i have written way over there somewhere only thing was that p got replaced so this was the p in the hamiltonian This clearly means that the one gets this formula of the Hamilton Jacob equation. Okay. It is very standard way to do. So now, you see, the idea would be is to check. So the solution of this equation will give me the large deviation functions okay, for the system, both equilibrium and outside equilibrium. Okay. So this I leave you, some parts I leave for you to check. You can check for the case of equilibrium. I had a very general formula, right, which was this phi of r, somewhere I have written, in terms of f, right? So d of x, f of r minus f of rho, prime of rho, r minus rho. Check that in equilibrium, it satisfies this equation. So one point one is to note, these large deviation functions, when I'm writing, I'm writing in the stationary state. So essentially, what one has to do in the stationary state, 
this time derivative is zero. So these five functions will satisfy an equation where this term right hand side is zero. So this is what I'm going to leave it to you to check in the equilibrium case. This is satisfied. So there is the integral from zero to one. And what is more in it? Is there something more? So this is, so one has to really solve in this equation is the formula for this function. Okay, so just quickly what I'm going to do now is to check that how could one check the formula for SEP No, no, so Hamiltonian, yeah, sorry. When I'm defining, yeah, so that's, I made a mistake, you're right. So the space integral, I will always write it. Just, just to put it in a standard uh, form of the action. So this was here, and the Hamiltonian I wrote. Okay, so let's just move to the SEP. So I'm just going to tell you, two steps of how to check that the SEP result works. The rest you have to really do the calculation to check. It's a bit non-trivial to check the SEP result in this. So I'm just, will tell you these two steps. So. so you remember, so you have the formula for SEP, right? So one, I'm not going to rewrite it again. So phi, there was an expression for phi which was written in terms of quantity F, capital F, and then capital F satisfies an equation, okay? Okay, and one additional thing which I kind of forgot to tell you, when in that expression, you have to use this boundary condition, so which was, should be there already, I mean, in addition to that form, this condition was there in the solution. So one is means the right part. Okay. So, if you want to check that SEP result is a solution of that equation, all you have to do, first, using that formula that I gave you, show that this equal to log, using that two formulas, both for the phi and equation for F. So this is, I'm just giving you so that you can check it yourself. Bit, uh, L X X F. And then all, if you take now this result, put it in the formula of H, which is here. Then that H, you can write down after a little bit of algebra, to simplify to this following form. So, it's a bit of an algebra, but if you don't know this part, it may be difficult to check. Okay. Now this is, okay, this is at x equal to one and x equal to zero. Now this function then simply becomes zero because at x equal to zero, rx is rho a and f is also rho a. At x equal to one, Again, they both are same, so this is zero. So this I only told you because you can check it yourself. It's just a little bit of algebra, but you have to do this two steps. Okay. okay, so this is one example where you could actually solve this way, and this is the way the original paper by Bertini et al. in 2000, that's how they solved it. Okay. So now, given this, now that I have talked about the hamilton jacob equation, Let's see what one could say about the long-range correlation for a general non-equilibrium diffusive system. So that means for any arbitrary d and sigma. And you will see that from this hamilton jacobi equation, one could see that long-range nature. Okay. So let's just write. Okay. So, okay, so let's, so if you are, so this idea about long-range correlation outside equilibrium has been studied quite a lot over the past three decades, even more. So I'm just going to give you two references, which I really like. And if you want to study more about correlations, long-range correlations outside equilibrium, 
can read these two papers. So this is by Garrido, Joel Lebowitz, Christian Mais, and Herbert Spoon. This is Fizdev A. It's in 1990, 42, and page number 1953. And the second one is a PRL. It's by Grinstein, Lee, and Subir Sachdev. This presents in a hydrodynamic description how one could think about this long-range correlations. Okay. So now the idea is that starting with this power of hamilton jacob equation, how could one see this long-range correlations in, these, in a general system? So for that, we are going to use this simple idea that I have introduced in the first lecture that the correlations, one could all correlations of all orders, one could derive from something called cumulant generating function. Right? So, so now all I want is the following. So I have R of X. This is the following large deviation function. And what I'm interested in all these spatial correlations. Let's say R of Z. These kind of, of many point correlations. Okay. How does one get this? So I told you that there is this formula, which is a Legenda transform of this uh, phi function, which is nothing but to so define another rest function, Hx, which is simply Legenda transform hx rx minus phi of r of x, then where the h of x is given by, this I talked in the first lecture. And there's another relation which comes from the inverse legenda transform, which is r of x is del g del h of x. So all, it's okay. So in addition to that, how does one get the correlations? It's simply because if, I, if one expands the function g, the expansion will give me all my correlations. It's actually the cumulants, but I discussed that they are essentially same. and so on, right? This is what I give in the first lecture. So now that if I know the hamilton jacobi equation in terms of phi, how can I get these correlations? Okay. The first, for that, first thing one has to do, write down the hamilton jacobi equation for the g variable, starting from the hamilton jacobi equation of the phi. Okay. It's very simple to do. So if I had, okay, all one has to do is the following. If you look at the hamilton jacobi equation, there things are written in terms of del phi del r and written in terms of r. So the hamilton jacobi equation is here. So what I'm now trying to do is to write down, transform this equation in terms of this generating function, the g. So what you have to do simply realize that del phi del r in, under this legenda transform is nothing but h of x and r is del g of h del h of x and in the stationary state i'm looking at that correlation in the stationary state so the right hand side is zero okay so all i have to do is this okay so this would give me the equation in, followed by this cumulant generating function g. Okay. Now the process is very simple. 
once you have that equation, use this idea that g, when I expand in terms of h, different powers in this order h will give me different order q correlations. What all I have to do, put that in that equation, expand the equation in powers of h, okay, and then look at the equation at every order in h. Okay. So let me just give you one example, what you would get if you write, ex write the expansion, to, let's say the linear order in h. So let me write it here. It's better to, to the linear order, what would you get? linear order, one would get dx, okay, h of x. So one has to do some integration bypass, but which are very simple to do. You get r, del x of r, equal to zero. Okay, so it's not going to, so remember, when I'm doing the expansion, okay, uh, So this I'm denoting as rho of x. So to the leading order, once you take this formula, put it in that hamilton jacob equation, look at the equation to the leading order, you will see that it only contains the term rho of x, and the equation would be like this. What does it mean? It means this is true for any test function h. So this quantity has to be zero. That means this quantity is constant, and you could already see this is nothing but the average current. So this would give you your average current, your formula. If I now look at to the second order, this would give me an equation for the two-point correlation. So I will have an equation which is of the order of something like dx dy, hx, hy, and some terms which is equal to zero. So this part you have to do, algebra. I'm just avoiding that. Now this is true for any hx, hy. So this part itself has to be zero. And this part will involve this two-point correlation. Okay. So some functions. Okay. So if you just write that down, then one gets, actually writes down this equation satisfied to so this part, and if rather, can nice looking form. Okay. So let me just write that. Then you would see that the long range correlation num co now comes very easily. So now it's of rho of x, which is the average uh, density profile. Then I'm going to write the two time correlation as cxy plus d2 dy2 d of rho of y c of xy equal to del x sigma of rho of x del prime x minus y. Similar way, you can actually write down again equation for three-point correlations, and there will be a very similar form that there is a Laplacian looking operator. And on the right-hand side, there's a charge. So if you think about for the case of D equal to one, this is just like a Poisson equation due to a charge on the right-hand side. You know from electrostatics that if the charge is localized, then you would get a power law behavior and here almost the correlation is like the potential in this equation. So this kind of tells you this equation that the, in general, the correlations will be long range by this simple electrostatic analogy. Okay. Just to make this point a little bit clearer, I just rewrite in a little different form, the same equation. I start from here and I write down Cx of y in a part which is equilibrium like 
twice d rho of x. So rho is the average density. And let's just write a short range part, which is delta correlated, which one expects in equilibrium. And there is another part which I write dxy. So what I'm doing here that outside equilibrium, I would expect that there is one part which could be short range correlated. So in this way, what I'm expecting that if I'm in equilibrium, this part would be zero. And I will end up with this form, okay? which is delta function means that in this uh, fluctuating hydrodynamics scale, the correlations are just delta correlated because I'm in a coarse grain scale, which is much larger than the correlations of the fast degrees of freedom. Okay. This would simply comes from the known result of the equilibrium large deviation function. And if you now look at this function, this satisfies again a very simple formula. So I'm just going to write down as D. D. And here it becomes quite evident what the charge looks like. It's just a convenient way to write the correlation. Okay. The first thing you note that this is the charge is proportional to the average current. So if that it's in equilibrium, if, so the average current is zero, then the B becomes zero. The second thing is this is a localized charge. Okay. So this would give you a long range correlation. So this whole analysis one could also generalize for in higher dimension. So this I presented in one dimension and one could derive this general result that Herbert Spohn and others had mentioned and Herbert Spohn also derived in his very first famous paper on fluctuating hydrodynamics in uh, long range correlations. The idea was that if I had in, uh, in a D dimension, if I have a system which is coupled or driven to non-equilibrium by coupling with two different reservoirs, and now I'm thinking in D dimensional system, then this long range correlation part goes as an inverse Laplacian. So this, you could first see in one dimension that this is consistent with this result. In two one higher dimension, you can also check that this works. So this is how one sees how long range correlation appears in outside equilibrium systems. Okay. Okay. So that's, so, so far what I've told you is how to calculate this large deviation function of density profile. Okay. And so far the outside equilibrium case, very few models which can be solved exactly. And for the very few models, there is an explicit ex formula for the large deviation function. Fast correlation of the fast modes. So the slow modes are long range correlated. No, so that's kind of starting with an assumption, of course. So you could start, have a system where you, let's say, don't have a separation of scale, then all these things will break down. Okay. But this formulation covers a large class of systems, already quite a large class of systems of practical interest. Okay, so, so far what I have told you, how to calculate this large deviation function of density profile using this action minimization formulation. Okay. There are three diff two different approaches that I have presented. One is this Hamiltonian formulation by which you just minimize the action by solving this Hamilton's set of equations. The other one is this Hamilton Jacobi method okay, where you can directly write an equation for the large deviation function itself. And here I've shown that from this equation, one could infer the long range nature of the correlation. Okay. Now this problem for large deviation of density has been explicitly solved for very few microscopic models and there is so far no general formula for arbitrary d and sigma so d and sigma decides which system i in but when one looks at the problem of the current 
which is something similar to the one that I mentioned in the Lanzfer equation, which is that large deviation of area. In that case, one could get a formula for the large deviation for arbitrary system, like for any d and sigma. And that is done by a very simple method of this additivity principle. And you will see that the result for that large deviation function comes out in just few lines without doing much of this kind of analysis. Okay? So that's the, something I'm going to present to you in the last 15 minutes. And you will see that the, the formula for the large deviation of current one could write down for a general system of arbitrary d and sigma. Okay? Okay. So let me just do that in the last 15 minutes. So far, are there any questions here? So in this case, they are not time independent. They are, of course, time dependent for the case of density profile. Yeah. For the case of current, you will see that the assumption is that they are time independent. Yeah. I mean, there are cases, of course, where it even breaks down. Yeah. Okay. So let me state the problem, which I want to really find. Now I'm interested in large division of current. So current is another quantity in outside equilibrium, which is a measurable quantity, and you would like to characterize the full statistics of it, okay? just like in the density. In this case, if I have this picture in mind, Yet, the same picture as before. I have row A, row B, I have system length L, and I want to measure what's the net flow of particle up to time capital T. Okay. So let's denote. So I'm just going to choose T wiggle as my total time window up to which I measure the net flow of current. So the large deviation form is the following. It's something very similar to the problem of area in the Langevin equation case that I described in the third lecture. So if this I write as R by L, because the current in the diffusive system scales as 1 over L, this has the following large deviation form. And the problem is to calculate this function y. Okay. okay. So the point is very similar as before. If I want to calculate for the case of not large t, then one could still formulate the problem in terms of action minimization. But this additivity conjecture would not work there. So the additivity conjecture works if you are considering t very large. Okay. And this is only true for the observables which scales with time. And as you could see here, the observable QT scales with time. Okay. Okay. So I've told you before that what is, so let's just write down QT in terms of the current. So this was the, something called integrated current, which is the net flow of particle after time T. So let's just define this quantity. So now I'm in the original variable, not in the coarse grain variable. Let's go to L. Okay. And this is my original current. So it turns out, if you now write them in terms of this coarse grain current, it simply becomes L D small x T, this goes from 0 to 1, this goes from 0 to tau, so I'm defining now under the coarse grain, right, so small x is x by L, T is T by L square, and tau is T wiggle by L square. Okay. So this I want is like as R by L. Okay. So this quantity I want as T wiggle by L times R. 
from just this, you will find out if I have done things correctly. This is equivalent of writing in terms of the micro. So now I have to do all these things in terms of microscopic, sorry, the coarse grain variables. to the leading order. So I'm now looking at a problem where I'm looking at for the probability of seeing the coarse grain current, the integral of that to be of this form. And I'm asking what's the probability of seeing this value of this integral, so which is equivalent of asking this question. This you can convince yourself. Okay, now the problem is very simple to derive. So let's just formulate, just write it down what we already know is how to write it in terms of this action. You see now what I want is what's the probability of this? Okay. So which is same as the probability of asking this question. So now I'm just asking, so I'm just going to write this quantity as just P of R. This, if I write now in terms of path integral, I'm looking at all possible paths. I have the action all now in the coarse grain variables. This is the standard action we started with. Okay. And with it, I want that there's this condition. Right? So there has to be a delta function. Minus tau. I made some mistake. There was no L here. All I have to do, now look at the probability of this one. So now let's just think what's happening here. So I want to see a large amount of particle flow over a very large time. Okay? And I want that particle flow to scale with the length of the time. So one simple way the system could do, it just forms a certain density profile and stays constant such that the current is exactly the same as equal to R. So then over a period of time tau, you will just satisfy this equation quite easily. Okay. So this is what exactly happens. So in this path integral, there are many such paths which could contribute. In the most likely path, which contributes to the most probable event for this amount of current to be seen, is the time independent path. Same as in the Langevin equation for the area problem. Okay. So the optimal path is simply so that I had you see all this current, uxt. So these are the optimal path. They are simply the current is r, and the density profile is simply so they are time independent. There is, of course, there is another delta function. If I use this idea, so this is what the additivity conjecture is. So the conjecture that the optimal profile for this event to happen is time independent. Okay. If I use that, then simply it would tell me from here, if I assume this time independent, it would simply tell me this is nothing but minus here the minimum of qx dx, the time integral. Okay, so let me just write them first. L tau x 
R plus D del X of Q whole square divided by twice the root. If I put this condition, put it here, look at it in the larger limit, I'll get this. You just put it and you'll just see that this is what is the case. But the crucial point to keep in mind that we are assuming that the most likely contribution comes from the time independent optimal part. So this is nothing but the large deviation function phi that we wrote. So let's just write it cleanly. So I'm not going to do too much algebra anymore. It's almost done. So phi of r, I'm just going to rewrite this part. It's nothing but minimum of qx integral dx r plus d del x q whole square divided by twice sigma q. Okay. This requires few algebras, but this is what the, at the end the result. Okay. And it simply came by putting the time independent solution in this action. And this is the consequence of additivity conjecture. Now what, you can minimize this part really easily. Remember the R is constant because that's what we want to observe. Okay. And this minimization you can do very easily using variational calculus. Very so let me just write down the result. So the result could only be again written in terms of in a parametric form. Okay. Unfortunately, there is no explicit formula. Let me just write down the final result. So if if you need help in deriving from here to the final result, I can do it in the tutorial, but you can also try it yourself and it's rather, you could arrive there in rather in few steps. So this is phi of r. So now it has a parametric representation. Let me just write down the formula. So it's from row A to row B of q divided by sigma of q 1 minus 1 plus k which should be a function of r 1 plus twice k r sigma of q where k is given by the solution of this equation. This is the formula. So this is now true for any d and sigma. So this is the power of this additivity conjecture that you could derive the result for this large deviation function for arbitrary d and sigma, which is for a really large class of systems. Okay. And you should always try to keep in mind why we are doing all these things, because at the end it's like calculating the free energy in the case of equilibrium systems. So all the efforts goes into finding exact expressions so that we could learn better about what's happening in the non-equilibrium systems. Okay. So one, another thing that you can easily derive a very important result, which I have been quoting for the last three, four lectures, which is this galafati cohen relation. So I told you that outside equilibrium as well as in equilibrium, there is a symmetry relation which is satisfied by the large deviation function. Okay. There are more than one, but this is a, one of the most important ones. So the symmetry relation, which you could just write down really easily, starting from this formula, all you have to show phi of r minus phi of minus r, you need to just show that this is equal to r rho a to rho b q twice d by sigma q. And this is nothing but r times mu d minus mu a. 
No, sorry, should be the mics. So this is the famous Galavati Cohen symmetry. So I'm now almost done. So, so far what I have told you in this entire lecture is I tried to tell you that the large deviation function is important for studying systems outside equilibrium because it plays the role which is equivalent to that of the free energy. It's not unambiguous for every problem yet, but it, this provides us a tool to study fluctuations in, out, in systems outside equilibrium and characterize those, okay? And also calculate or find out many symmetry relations, just like symmetries in, let's say, free energies, okay? So what I have told you that there is, there are many ways of calculating the large deviation function. There are microscopic solutions and many other ways. So one of the way is to start from this coarse grain description and go through this action formulation, which is this macroscopic fluctuation theory. And so far, it provides a systematic tool to calculate this large deviation function for a large class of driven diffusive systems. So, there are, so I have given you so far few examples, so mostly the calculation of large deviation in density and that of the current. But then there are many other problems where many results has been obtained in the past one decade. And then there are many other even open problems which one could try to find out. There's one problem which, like you could have asked, so far what we have done all these calculations, but are there any results where one could test the results from experiment? So there's, in my opinion, uh, there's one analysis which is about something called tagged particle in single file, where one could do calculations where the results could be tested in the experimental laboratory. Okay? So if you want, uh, so I don't have the exact reference, but you could look at the calculation of large deviation of tagged particle in something called single file, which just describes many particles in a one-dimensional channel, and then you look at the statistics of position of one particle. And that large deviation function one could calculate in a very similar manner. And this you can find in one of my paper. So this is... It's published in JSTAT. It is. I think it's 2016. I don't have the exact reference. But if you want to study how one could use this action formulation and learn how one could calculate the statistics of tagged particle, then you could look at it in this paper. And the formulas that one gets, for example, the variance of the tagged particle position, this has been derived earlier using mode coupling theories and other methods. And the results that one gets from this way agrees with most of the results that is available in the literature, which kind of confirms the consequences that one could get by doing this very complicated kind of analysis. And you would show that at least in one example, you would get results where you could directly test an experiment. So now there are many other open problems. So one of the most important open pro problems that is still remains open is how to generalize this kind of ideas for the system which are bulk driven. Okay? So, so far what I have told you that I'm looking at the systems where there is no asymmetry if you look at the dynamics only in the bulk. So what by that I mean if I make rho A equal to rho B, okay, then this system satisfies detail balance. But I could have thought of models where there is particles which are under an external force. Okay? So let's say the electric field. So in that case, if the field is really strong, this, so far the, this kind of hydrodynamic analysis has not been developed uh, very well yet. Although on the other hand, the results for these kind of large deviation functions has been obtained by exact microscopic solution. So this is one direction which is still remains open. Then you can also keep one thing in mind that essentially whatever we are doing is kind of analysis of stochastic, uh, stochastic differential equations. So there could be many other systems where one could think of fluctuating hydrodynamic equation. 
for example, the active matter system. You can start thinking of fluctuating hydrodynamic description, just what probably Sriram is talking now, even today. And you can try to think about for all those kind of problems, this kind, whether one could apply this kind of techniques and get the large deviation function. So for example, you can think about this very simple model of active matter, which is called activated Brownian particle. So these are all open problems, okay? So these are not, has not been solved. And some of you maybe can try and probably even solve these problems. So this is the problem, let's say, in active matter. And this is called activated Brownian particle. Which is simply, is if you take the particles, each of them just with a certain let's say size, and they're just moving. They're moving ballistically, but the direction is making a Brownian motion. Okay. Then if you take this system, then it has been found in numerical simulation that it shows some kind of liquid gas kind of coexistence as you change the densities. Okay. And then you can ask, what is the large deviation for the density profile in this problem? Can one write down a fluctuating hydrodynamics equation for these systems? And can then one write down large deviation for let's say a density profile? With this kind of liquid gas coexistence, can one see from the properties of this phi function? Okay. So these are the kind of open problems where you could see that this kind of techniques of action minimization may be uh, applicable, and one could hopefully in future find out more interesting results from this kind of very elaborate techniques. So, okay. With that, I thank you for all your patience, and I thank Avishek and Sanjeev for inviting me.